This is John Sullivan. I will do this when I'm supposed to be John Sullivan. Some of this is, this is so not going to work. This is going to be great. How do I? No? Well, this is, this is going to, oh wait, no, there's a right click button. Left click. That, 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 that. There, okay. It's going to be great. We'll figure this out. That'll happen a whole bunch more times. It'll be wonderful. Um, I'm not John Sullivan. Uh, he can't make it here because it turns out my legs are much more reliable than his plane. Um, however, he did tell me to break a leg, but thankfully that didn't happen until right before this. Otherwise, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble. Uh, I'm Molly DeBlanc. I work at the Free Software Foundation. Uh, oh, and by the way, um, if I talk too fast, just yell Molly talk slower. Because uh, I have a tendency to talk fast when I get excited, and I get really excited about free software. Um, so I'm the campaigns manager at the Free Software Foundation. I've been there since June 5th. Uh, this is my first talk as a representative of the Free Software Foundation, so I hope it goes well, and that they don't fire me because I'm still in my probationary period. Um, however, John Sullivan <laughs> has been the director for six years, the executive director, and he's been with the FSF actually since 2003. He's, he's been around a long time, and we like him a lot. Um, uh, who here was born after 1985? Any, anyone? Me? Right? We are the GNU generation. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that one. Um, that was Paul Tagg's joke, actually, so give him props where props are due. Um, you know, we've actually never lived in a world without free software. Uh, free software really did come about before 1985, but that's when the Free Software Foundation or the FSF was founded. Uh, things were a little bit more formalized at that point. Um, and we can really recognize that for some of us in this room at least, we've never known a world where free software didn't exist. And that's something really cool, right? Um, at the FSF and the GNU project, we have this goal. We want all, uh, all computer users to be able to do everything they need using only free software, right? So this isn't, we're not saying that it's great if you can run free software. Our dream, our goal, our fantasy for the future is that at some point, everything you're doing will be done using free software. Um, so John's titled this talk, Freedom Embedded. It is not about embedded systems. It's about the idea that when we, ha we have all these devices and they're not necessarily running free software, they're running all sorts of different things. So we want to think about what it means for software to be uh, free on our computers when we get them on our, on our devices. Um, it's subtitled Devices That Respect Users in Their Communities because we really want to emphasize in this talk the idea that we're talking about user freedom. We're not necessarily talking about the technology itself. We're talking about the people who use the technology. We're talking about you, your friends, your neighbors, your family, the people who are impacted by these tools that they're using. Um, so I'm going to really quickly go over the four freedoms. Uh, I am delighted that many of you already know what these are uh, and that this is a little superfluous, um, but it's nice to go over them anyway. Uh, there are two misconceptions that uh, bother John um, about free software and the four freedoms. So just to cover them really quickly uh, is that when there's a license that meets the free software definition, chances are, I'll just keep my hand on this other button. Uh, did that, I broke it. It'll figure it out. Um, chances are it also meets the open source definition, right? And the open source definition, as you may know, is based on the Debian free software guidelines, which were an attempt to describe what it looks like for a piece of software to be free. Um, so things that are free probably are also open, and things that are open are probably also free. Yes? Oh, are they hitting the mic? I'll just, how do I? I'll just take them off. But they they look so cool. Uh, no, it's it's I don't want to be imbalanced. <laughs> Style is very important, guys. Uh, Cool. The other thing um, about free software is sometimes people will come up to me or other people uh, involved in standard setting organizations and say, so I want to make a license that's free, but, and the but's always nervous, right? And that's when they say, but I don't want the government to be able to use it, or I don't want anyone to be able to make money on it. Uh, and when someone does that, what's actually happening is that license isn't free, right? For something to be free, it needs to be able to be used uh, this is number two, 
Maybe it's okay. We'll we'll work on we'll. Oh, that works. Ah, that worked for some reason that time. Um, great. So. Right, so the freedom to run the program for any purpose. And this includes, like, you know, you're taking a risk when you're making something free. You're saying that the government might use it, that someone you don't like might use it, um, and also that it might be used for commercial purposes, uh, regardless of whether you're making any money off of that. Next one is the freedom to study the, how the program works and change it to do whatever you wish. Um, uh, usually when I talk to people who aren't already involved in free software, I talk about two things that I like a lot, which are cooking and knitting. Um, so for example, you know, I have a lot of friends who are vegan. So let's say I'm cooking something, but I want to make sure my vegan friends can still eat it. Right? So I replace butter with oil, I replace eggs with applesauce and flax seeds. So I'm making these modifications to the recipe, and I'm allowed to do that. Right? Uh, these start with zero, so freedom number two is the freedom to distribute copies to help your neighbor. So I can share my recipe with whomever I want. Uh, and not only that, I can share my modifications. So it's not just that I'm making these changes for my own benefit, I'm making these changes and then letting everybody else benefit from those. Right? Okay, so next thing, new topic. Um, let me find a slide for that. Okay, that's the one I want. Um, so a lot of people don't actually know when they're using free software. A lot of stuff is free and a lot of machines, devices, and actually just like the world we interact with at large has freedom inside of it. Uh, and we might not know that. Android is a good example of this, right? Android is one of the largest free software projects in the world in terms of users. There are over a billion people using it. That's incredible. However, see, that's that but again. Um, the however in this case is that chances are if you're using Android, you're also using the Google Play Store, um, which is proprietary. When we're using something that's free, we have to be aware, especially when it comes to our devices and integral ways that they're working together, is that what we think is free might not necessarily be so. Um, one of our like, examples that we keep coming back to about this is we talk about DRM, because DRM is easy to talk about and a lot of people can connect to it. Uh, one example of this was in 2009, Amazon, famously if you care about these things and follow them, uh, removed copies of 1984 from Kindle e-readers, uh, ones that people had purchased. Uh, people interviewed who had had their copies removed, a lot of them were students. And not only did they lose the books, they lost the notes they had taken about the text. Um, this was for copyright reasons and it was enabled by the fact that there's DRM. Uh, so it turns out that even though you own something, uh, you might not own it. Um, or at least there might not be technological tools in place to keep somebody from taking it from you. Uh, in the Amazon case, what happened after that is they said, okay guys, we promise we will never do this again. Swear to God, no, you know. But they didn't make any changes in terms of how they interact with your Kindle and how you interact with your eBooks from the tech perspective. What this means is that actually last year, they then went on and took all the books from other people. And this has happened on several occasions that they just happened to make a bunch of things disappear. Um, Emo Phillips, I don't know who that is. If any of you know, cool. Uh, you can tell me later. Um, he made a joke. One day a woman came up to me and said, didn't I see you on television? I said, I don't know. You can't see out the other way. Uh, so it actually turns out that you kind of can see out the other way. Uh, Vizio um, uh, is a company that, among other things, uh, makes, uh, makes software on televisions. Uh, I assume most of you have computers in your pockets. I mean, uh, I actually took mine out of my pocket. This is my pocket computer. Um, uh, it turns out that I also have a computer there, um, and I'm sure there are a bunch of other ones in this room. Uh, you know, our television, that's a computer. Um, so the software that's being run on it, when it's not free, when it is still proprietary software, you know, we're looking at these things we don't control. So in Vizio's case, what this actually turned out to mean was that they had created software that read the pixels on the computer, i.e. the television, in your, in, in your home and reported back what was on it, like what you were watching. So there's a lot of power in, in demography, in the demographic studies of who's watching things on television, what kinds of other things that they're watching, how this plays into marketing. Um, 
And it's really well studied. So like, you know, it's, it's kind of useful, arguably, for a company to know, OK, well, the people who are watching Game of Thrones are also watching X-Files reruns. Um, but it turns out that they weren't just doing that. They were, in fact, matching those to IP addresses. So it wasn't just like, oh, there's this person who does this thing. It was, oh, Molly watches Game of Thrones and X-Files reruns. And while I'm pretty open about both of those things, that doesn't necessarily mean I want a company to know that and that that company has the right, they have the right, not me, to sell that information to whomever they want or give it away to whomever they want. This could be used in, in terms of like what this looks like practically is it can be used for things like governments learning about your political affiliations. Um, it could be used by your health insurance company that wants to know what sorts of things you're doing. Are you watching a lot of television? Maybe we should raise your rates because you're probably not that healthy. Um, not to make that correlation, that was one John made. Um, so how does this happen, right? Uh, key pieces of software are proprietary. You know, we get these cool things looking back on your, uh, your phone if you're running Android, is you have this like, really neat thing, but also a very integral part of how it works is proprietary. You know? uh, Amazon has, uh, on their Kindles, a lot of them are based on Android or GNU Linux in different ways, but still DRM technologies and other restrictive technologies that come on them are proprietary. Um, devices are locked down and don't provide builder installation info. So sometimes you do have access to the code in something, but that doesn't mean you can actually do anything with your phone. I love my phone. It's a OnePlus. It's great. Uh, They're not paying me to say that. Um, but I also can't take the battery out of it, uh, which is really annoying. Um, uh, and I'm using that as kind of like a different example of the same thing, which is you could have something and you can in theory have access to it because I can pry the back off of it. Uh, but taking the battery out, like doing anything with it is really hard. Um, network connectivity has no granular user control. Remember when, is this on the next slide? Yes, great, perfect. Um, actually, no, I want to go back, sorry. Um, so one of the things that's happening now, I believe it's one of the newer versions of Windows, is you're forced to accept uh, security and other updates whenever they want to have it pushed to your computer, right? What this means in practice is this company now has access to your computer in ways that you can't tell them no. Um, so not only do you not know what they're doing, do you not know what they're putting on your devices, they don't know, you don't know when they're doing it. Um, here's this example of some DDoS attacks. Uh, because devices weren't under the control of users, um, you know, and because they also had some proprietary software, those pieces of proprietary software were all actual dangers that allowed, that allowed uh, criminals to get access to your machines and do things to change them. Uh, there are many, many more examples of both technologies and horrible things that have happened. You can check those out at gnu.org slash proprietary. Um, so what can we do? How do we deal with this that we're living in this scary, dangerous world? Uh, well, one thing we can do is teach basic computer literacy. Uh, looking back at cooking, uh, I hope or assume many of you know how to read a recipe. I know how to read a recipe. That doesn't necessarily mean you know how to cook or know how to cook anything in particular. What it means is you have an idea of how different parts fit together. When we talk about computer literacy, we're not talking about teaching everyone to code. Instead, what we're hoping is that people will be able to think about how their computers work, to understand how their computers work, and to see how the parts of them fit together. Um, Right, persuading people to care. Thankfully, luckily, many of you care. That's why you're here. I really appreciate that. I care. Um, that can be really hard, making people care about something. Uh, but when we can do it, it's great, and it gets them more involved, and it gets them thinking more. Right? We can enable people to act on things. This, this is clear labeling. Um, clear labeling can mean things like just making it explicit whether something is coming in an OK way or something is coming in a way that restricts your freedoms right out the door. Uh, so DRM labeling books says having DRM is one example of this. Alternatively, labeling things as being DRM free or lead certified or humane uh, provides that uh, security as well. Uh, we can meet demand. Um, I don't know about the rest of you. There are lots of things that I really want to do with free software that I can't do. This doesn't mean I use proprietary equivalents. This just means I don't do them, and I'm frustrated, and I sit at home, and I cry, and I don't have an e-reader anymore because mine broke. Uh, so I read less. It's kind of sad. Um, uh, so by creating tools that will allow people to meet those demands, we're doing a great job. We can also grow the movement. It's accomplished by a lot of these other things, getting more people involved. Um, 
So one of the things that we do when we talk about labeling is we look at licenses, right? Um, so how do we know if something is under the GPL? This is some information uh, about the GPL. If you would like to know more about it, I'm not going to read it. I think it is useful to read slides for people who uh, have vision impairment. There's a lot of text here. You can read it yourself. It's great. Uh, it's a great read. Somebody told me that once, and I read it and found out that that was true. Um, so how do we know something has the, uh, has the GPL? Well, it can be hard to tell which software comes inside of something um, and what the licenses on that software are. Because devices and computers can be very complex machines that have lots of different moving parts. Right? So you might know that your phone runs Android, but that doesn't mean you know what else it runs or like what Android is connected to and what those libraries are, even what a library is. Um, uh, it can also be dangerous to download free software, right? Uh, there are attempts and work at enforcement um, surrounding free software, uh, things with people labeling things as free or people labeling things as open source. Uh, but there is not, um, there aren't the kinds of regulations that come around other sorts of things uh, that people are, are being labeled, uh, that things with things that are being labeled. Um, uh, also, when you're downloading a piece of free software, similarly, actually, when you're downloading any piece of software, is you're trusting that the person who made it is, is worth your trust, that you're trusting that they're going to respect you and that they're not going to do something awful to your computer. As many of us are probably aware, that is not always the case, and lots of horrible things show up on your computer all the time. Um, and it's hard to find all the license notices in something. I don't know if you've had this experience, but I'll be told, oh, you know, we're going to have this meeting using this teleconferencing tool. I'll be like, great. Well, what, what license does it use? Is it free? And, and they won't know. So I'll look at the company, and then they'll see something somewhere. And then I like, have to find their GitHub page, but it doesn't have a license file. So I have to file a bug requesting that they had a license file. Or sometimes, if I feel really snarky, I just like, you know, commit and say, hey, this should have the GPL. They don't usually go for that. Um, I recommend it, though, on add license files if you don't have them on your things. Um, uh, but also, like, and then you're like, OK, well, this part of it has a free software license, but I also need this other thing to make it work. And there's nothing about their client that they're using on the, like, do I need to use, can I use the desktop client or the web client? So then you write them an email. And then you're talking to someone from tech support who doesn't know what a license is. And you go, oh, god, I'm now that jerk. Um, so those things happen, right? So there are hardware labeling. This is one way that hardware labels can look. Uh, labeling comes in all shapes and forms. Uh, there, I think it's Diema, that's the car manufacturer. And when you get a car, you get this nice thick book of all the licenses uh, that are being used to make it run. I think that's so cool. Um, and some of these things are like kind of unhelpful. Like, you know, you look at the piece of chocolate and it says may contain nuts, milk, eggs, or soy because it's processed in a facility that has peanuts. Um, this is kind of the same thing. This is from a Linksys router. Uh, it's not very helpful. Um, upon request, I also I love this. Source codes, uh, so open source software source code is available at cost from Linksys for at least three years from the product purchase date. Uh, that's really cool. So this is one way that we think these sort of things should work instead. You know, we don't think it should come saying, hey, here's some stuff that might be involved with your technology. We think it should say, hey, just so you know, when you first get this thing, it's really dangerous. You don't know what's going to happen with it. You have to trust some people who you don't know to see if it works. Uh, and good luck. Uh, here's one example of friendlier labeling. So it's not only are we not looking at a lot of text on something, we're looking at something that's cute and easily recognizable. This is from the, this is the Leaping Bunny program from Coalition for Consumer Information, Information on Cosmetics. What this means is that your stuff was not tested on animals uh, and that it is animal friendly. Uh, we were inspired by this, so this is what we came up with. Oh, wow, I'm going through this very quickly. Great. Um, uh, we came up with this idea for the Respect Your Freedoms certification. Uh, what we wanted to do with Respect Your Freedoms was come up with something similar to the Leaping Bunny, something people could look at devices and say, hey, like this is free software. And not only is this free software, this is running on completely free software. Um, kind of as a side note, there is this thing called HNode. 
Um, it, you know, RYF is, we call respective freedoms RYF. RYF is different than a hardware compatibility database. That is not what it is. Uh, HNode, however, does provide a hardware compatibility database and commentary on what sorts of thing, like what, what different devices have different technologies, what you can do with them, what you can't do with them. Um, so that's a different program. It's totally worth looking into. It's hnode.org, um, and it's great. Oh, yeah, it's in the top left. Great. Um, so what are the RYF criteria? Nothing changed. Uh, what are the RYF criteria? Um, the first thing is that you know it's running 100% free software. So everything that you're obviously interacting with is free. Uh, we have an exception for secondary embedded processors, like this. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, there's an exception for secondary embedded processors, like firmware on a hard drive. We want users to be able to upgrade and control the software at as many levels as possible. If and when the freedom becomes available for use in a secondary processor, we, accept cert we expect certified products will adopt it within a reasonable period of time. Uh, we expect that users will be able to install modified software. Um, so it's not just that we can download things from the App Store, but we'll be able to you know, install something that our friend changed and then send to us on however people are sending. Are people still using floppy disks? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, compilation. Um, that you'll be able to maintain software. Um, that uh, there'll be installation guidelines. That it's not like you're installing this thing and they're like, good, good luck, have your, enjoy yourself in the future. Um, that they'll be, they'll be doing some work to help you with that. There'll be no spying or back doors. I feel like, I hope that's obvious. Um, so we actually say you can support uh, encumbered formats. Um, but you also have to be able to support unencumbered formats. Um, so you can have proprietary file formats and proprietary file extensions as long as there are also free ones involved. Um, patents need to be licensed to all users. Uh, I'm not a patent expert. Um, we will have someone here later today or tomorrow who is, and you can talk to Deb Nicholson if you want more details about how patents interact with software and how patents interact with you as a user and what that means for you as a hacker or somebody who wants to modify the software you're using. Documentation must be free. Free documentation uh, refers to documentation under some Creative Commons licenses and similar things. Uh, there's the GNU documentation license. It's things that ensure the four freedoms, but when you're looking at text rather than software. Um, we, you can't have misleading endorsements, so you can't say, oh, you know, this is RYF certified, but it's also made especially for Macs, unless, you know, Apple's also adding a certification to that. Um, you also have to cooperate with FSF and GNU communication. Um, we use a lot of specific language at the Free Software Foundation because we think it's important to make different kinds of linguistic distinctions. Uh, one of the clearest examples of this is we say GNU Linux rather than Linux. We say free software. Uh, we infrequently say free open source software. Um, so we say free software. Uh, there are a number of other terms. We uh, have a website if you want to read all about them. So we request that people use terms like GNU Linux instead of just Linux. Uh, this is our first certified product. I'm going to read this because John wrote it and it's great. Yes, it's called the Lulzbot, but it's no joke. We were very serious about certifying it. Um, so the Lulzbot is a 3D printer made by Aleph uh, Objects. Um, it's pretty cool. We have a bunch of them in the office. So if you ever are in Boston, you should come visit the FSF and you can make something with one of them or just look at the line of like nine of them sitting there. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, for us, it was kind of convenient when they sent uh, their device to be certified, the first one. Um, you can't really see this, but somewhere in that there's uh, an RYF mark um, which had been used uh, in a photo for Make Magazine, um, which was great, like, immediate publicity. Uh, this is a thing that the founder of Aleph Objects said. It is long, but I have some time, so I'm going to read it to you. Aleph Objects, Inc. is honored to have the first hardware product with the FSF's Respect Your Freedom certification mark, and we're proud to sell a 3D printer that delivers freedom to each and every user. Aleph Objects, Inc. was founded with the idea that people should be free to use, learn from, and improve the machines they use in and share their improvements and innovations with collaborative communities, i.e. the four freedoms. The spirit and philosophy of the free software movement is embodied in our Lulzbot 3D printer. All of our printers ship with hardware design, software, and documentation all under free licenses. You get it all. Source code, design documents, and specifications. Everything needed to control, tinker, fix, and improve upon every aspect of the printer. 
Here are some more products we've certified. Uh, Think Penguin, um, I believe they're a sponsor here, unless John's notes are outdated. Um, uh, they've done some pretty cool things. One of the things that they've done is they've taken uh, uh, IBM ThinkPads and refurbished them so that when you get them out of the box, uh, they're running entirely free software. Uh, something I don't think I really emphasized uh, earlier and the way it deserved to be was that when you're getting something that's RYF certified, oh wow, it's 10 minutes? It's not an hour? Okay, TIL. Um, uh, uh, when you're getting something uh, RYF certified out of the box, what that really means is that every aspect of it is running free software. Um, and not only is the company making a promise to you, because companies make promises all the time that they don't keep, see Amazon mentioned a while ago, um, but it means that we at the FSF, we with our very strict and high standards, are also saying that we believe, uh, we believe in this product and we think it's doing a good job. Uh, here's some other stuff, think Penguin has a wireless broadband router. See, that's a cool RYF label. Uh, here are some statistics of some specific things. Technoethical uh, had created a bunch of products not too long ago. There were 16 of them. Um, the office was a disaster because we had stuff everywhere. Um, while we looked at them, everything that's certified is certified piece by piece. We take it apart, we put it back together, we look at every part of how it works. Uh, our licensing team is amazing, and you should thank them all for the work they do. I love Objects 3D printers, Think Penguin, Mini Free, Vikings, uh, and Wanta Liquidity. Um, it's more software. It's the X200s, you know, modified. Um, so if you want to read more about the certifications, that's online. It's uh, at u.fsf.org slash 28x. You can also poke around our webpage for that. I know you're all going to copy that down and look it up as soon as you, this talk ends. Um, also, Purism, you know, they're here, they're sponsor. You should talk to them uh, if you have more questions about this. Um, they're, uh, they make laptops that respect your rights. They are not RYF certified, um, but they are trying really hard to do a good job. They're very dedicated to the four freedoms, and we respect that. Um, they did crowdfunding to get a lot of their work started, um, and they raised almost double their goal of $250,000. It's very impressive. Um, Novena is another company that bills itself as a, like a, a goal, like a company that has this goal of supporting those sorts of ideals uh, and involvements. And again, if you look, you notice that they like went significantly above their crowdfunding goal. Um, uh, and then there's Libra Boot uh, as another example of something cool. I'm going to read another John note here because it was great. Um, wow, I am so far ahead than his notes are. Um, thank you for your patience. You guys are great. Um, I can't find this. Oh, yeah. Uh, Libra Boot came into being in order for the maintainer to be able to make and sell laptops that meet our criteria. It replaces the computer's proprietary boot firmware with free software. But it's, uh, and this is really important to me. Uh, people sometimes criticize the FSF for pushing too hard for not compromising enough. But people want us to promote laptops that are more free than, some people want us to promote laptops that are more free than most laptops. But we have examples like this where our standards helped inspire what we wanted to see, right? So the people working on Libreboot wanted to meet this qualification. They wanted to create something that we thought would be great too. Um, so what do we need? We need new laptops. Refurbished laptops are great. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, but it would also be really cool if people could go and purchase an entirely new laptop that's fresh off the, however they make them, the belt, uh, that is completely free, you know, that respects who they are. Um, tablets, everyone's into tablets these days. Mobile communicators, cell phones or equivalents. E-readers, please, please, please make me an e-reader. I would really like it. It'd make me happy. Um, and then there are all kinds of new hardware that we're coming up with. There are medical devices. That's a big deal. Um, uh, we have wearables. We have virtual reality. We have these things coming out that are integrating into our lives in more and more intense ways. Uh, one of the things I say when I talk about free software is that someday people are going to be updating Twitter with their eyes. Um, uh, and I actually don't think that that, that, that is far off. Um, and it would be pretty scary if that was being done proprietarily. Also a car! You get a car, you get a car. Okay. Um, we're getting self-driving cars and electric cars, right? And it would be really great if we could trust all those things. Uh, but with cars especially, you know, there are these structural barriers. There are these institutional policies that have been created that keep people from being able to do these things all on their own, right? 
Um, so there, uh, there are like requirements of hardware jail, jails. There have to be ways that people can't access technology, according to the FCC and other government organizations. Um, there's a lack of free software, uh, GPU firmware. Um, a lack of support for certain chipsets uh, by free distros. So like, if you've had the experience of installing Debian and then suddenly your wireless card doesn't work and you have a really hard time figuring that out, dot, 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 extrapolate from there. Um, Intel Management Engine and AMD's equivalent, there are a lot of problems with that. Uh, we've been doing some writing. Alison Randall's nodding, so you can talk to her about it later, um, or you can read our website. Um, here are some future plans of ours. Uh, we're discussing levels. Sometimes people ask us why there aren't levels. Why aren't you saying this is more free and this is less free? Um, and it's because we think it's important that when we say this is our YRYF certified, it actually is freedom respecting from the parts you see to the parts you don't um, and all the ways it works. Uh, so we don't want to compromise that. Um, we have 11 pending uh, applicant companies with products to review. It's really exciting. Some people have sent us stuff. Some people haven't. The office is really cluttered. We're at the bottleneck. It is our fault. That's kind of cool. Um, and it would also be great if people funded development, right? So crowdfunding is kind of, we're looking back at this as the example. Um, development is expensive, right? Uh, one of the things that came out of Purism's work is they, uh, they did a survey of people who'd purchased their product, and a lot of them actually said that RYF certification was meaningful to them. Um, so participating with projects and by telling them these things, it does impact the decisions they're making. Um, uh, there have been a number of successful crowdfunding campaigns that we have written about and other people have written about, um, so you should look more into that if you are interested in it. Uh, we think it'd be great, and we hope to help directly fund more free software um, development uh, and reverse engineering. The FSF is working on putting together a reverse engineering award. Um, so if that's a thing you're interested in, uh, you can check out our website or talk to me or email us to get some more information on that. And then those are the sorts of things that are really necessary for us to understand how these weird closed technologies work um, so we can build better ones. Yeah. There, uh, here's a statement from RMS that I'm also going to read. I might read a little quickly. Uh, for free designs to give us hardware freedom, we need future fabrication technology. We can envision a future in which our personal fabricators can make chips and our robots can assemble and solder them together with transformers, switches, keys, displays, fans, and so on. In that future, we will all be able to make our own computers and fabricators and robots, and we will be able to take advantage of modified designs made by those who know hardware. The argument for rejecting non-free software will then apply to non-free hardware designs too. Uh, that's a bit why we think uh, standards for hardware freedom are important and actually just hardware freedom is important in general. Some conclusions. We think things are possible. We think there's a bright, beautiful future coming ahead of us and that if we work hard and work together, we can make it happen. Um, labels help people care, right? Uh, it reminds them that this is something that they should care about. It makes them aware of this thing and it puts it in their face. And then it helps them make good choices and it helps them raise awareness. You know? uh, so if when you go to the store, seeing that humane, like, humanely certified raise like, stamp on your eggs, like, that actually matters. Um, these are things we need now more than ever. The world is a scary place and it's only getting scarier uh, in terms of surveillance, in terms of privacy, in terms of DDoS attacks, in terms of everything that involves with how, that's involved with how deeply technology and computers are penetrating our lives in every way, um, and how insecure and scary they are. Uh, but market demand is not enough because proprietary software is subsidized, right? So uh, you may or may not have thought of this, but um, you know, there's the, in the US there's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That is something that US taxpayers are funding to exist, are funding to be perpetuated. You know, in the US we are paying for courts to deal with those cases. The government is helping these sorts of technologies persist. Right? In the EU, you're seeing the link tax. I think that's Article 5 or 9 or 3. I think it's a prime number. Um, uh, you can read more about that later, but that's another thing where there's like a lot of time and energy and money from people in the EU being gone into like further restricting the ways people use technology in the internet. That kind of sucks and is taking advantage of us. Um, so you should support us in the work we do. There are a lot of ways you can do it because RYF is great and you all care about RYF now and you want to see the best completely freedom respecting devices everywhere and you're going to, next laptop you're going to buy is going to come out the door with Libreboot and it's going to be great. Um, 
So one of the things you can do is buy those ROIF devices, right? Um, you can join the FSF. You can always join the FSF. It's great. I hope many of you are FSF members because it allows me to do things like come here and eat. Uh, I like both of those things. Um, uh, we're funded, 80% uh, of our funding comes from support and donations by members. That's huge. Uh, it's something we're very proud of um, that we like, really get to work for our members because we're supported by them uh, and we're not like, beholden to companies. Uh, we need volunteers to help review RYF applications. If you care about these things and have any knowledge of them or you want to learn more, please contact us. You can email us at info at fsf.org. We'll triage those emails to the licensing team and the people who are working on this stuff. There are only 13 of us on staff total, so the RYF team is actually just two people, one of whom is doing the majority of the work. Um, we really need volunteers to help out with that. Uh, you can also talk to Allison Randall about what it would be like to volunteer on RYF certification. Uh, you can subscribe to our free software supporter, which is available in French. It is also available in Spanish. Um, I can't read either, but I trust our translation team. Uh, you can ask your employer to support us. And you can learn reverse engineering, because reverse engineering is really cool. OK, that's what I've got. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you all bearing with me. Uh, because this was John's talk, and I'm glad that you showed up anyway. I know I'm not as cool as John Sullivan, but I have better hair, so. Um, is there time for questions? Yes. OK. Now I, can, now I can finally walk across the stage. Oh, thank God. Uh, can you elaborate on ask your employer to support us, uh, how that would work? Is there some official thing they can do? Yes, so things that are currently going on um, is we do have sponsorships. Um, there are different ways sponsorships look. One of them is one of our, the big things we do each year is we have the Libra Planet Conference in March. Um, we don't have dates yet. We're planning it. We just started. But all of you should come. You should all submit talks for the call for proposals. And it's super fun and super awesome. And they're totally stylish t-shirts, almost as cool as the DevConf ones. Um, uh, so, like, we do take sponsorships for DevConf, but actually the FSF also takes sponsorships flat out. Um, that's where a significant amount of that 20% that doesn't come from supporters uh, and donors uh, comes from. Um, some of it also comes from grants, uh, but the majority of it does come from, like, organizational support. Uh, we do take donations um, in terms of, uh, like, technology at, or... We take time. If your company wants to volunteer someone's time to us, um, we appreciate things like that. Uh, if you want to, if your company wants to like donate actual equipment, um, as long as it's good equipment and not like, here are the servers we were going to throw out. Do you guys want them? Um, we also like things like that. Does anyone else? Huh? <laughs> Thank you for asking all the questions. So when companies send you these things to evaluate for respective freedom, are they just sending it like that and you have to figure it out or are they sending <laughs> tons of internal documentation about every chipset or what's the usual process? Um, I only know so much about that. Um, Allison knows more, so you should ask Allison. I love you, it. You can actually look at the requirements on the website, but there are a set of requirements for the information that they have to send, including the full corresponding source code and any special instructions for booting it. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it is a standardized process. And a lot of what we're looking for, I mean, a lot of the companies are sending in the exact same hardware, so that helps. We can just verify that it is definitely running Libra boot. It is, you know, like mm -hmm. verify that the source, they do have the full corresponding source code and instructions and all of that. So it's. It's, it's basically just a lot of tick box policy checks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fairly standard procedure. Mm -hmm. It's not very difficult to follow. I think the way, the, the thing that catches people up the most often is not necessarily the hardware, but there's some requirements around like your store adequately discussing free software or software freedom and um, things like that that sometimes confuses people a little bit. But, that that gets straightened out pretty quickly, and pretty people are always eager to to make the changes necessary. Mm -hmm. so. um, and kind of adding to that, when we're looking for volunteers to participate in those processes, it's not just we're looking for people to come into the office and take apart computers and say, okay, this is the chipset that this is actually has put on the board. We're we're actually also just looking at people to like make sure that everything is on the application and that it's complete, uh, and that's a lot of overhead.
someone else? You can ask other questions about how cool the FSF is. Hey, you talked about um, how proprietary software is subsidized by, um, say, the governments in EU, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is the FSF doing anything in that direction to, 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 to prevent that, to any advocacy in that area, sort of politically, as it were? OK. Um, so there are a few things. Uh, I think this is actually a great topic um, that I would love to talk with anyone more about uh, if they're interested in the future. Um, so one of the things is that actually like the US government is, is really just funding the development of a lot of proprietary software in terms of things that they're making for themselves, things that they're paying contractors to make. Uh, one of the first big attempts at uh, kind of trying to work, like trying to fix this, um, side note about the US here in the United States, uh, everything produced by the US government, i.e. funded with taxpayer money, is supposed to belong to the people. In practice, this isn't the case. This is why, for example, when many Europeans uh, give talks about space or use photos from space, they use ones from NASA because those are public domain as opposed to the ones from ISA, which are not. Um, uh, so there's this, this federal open source code policy, which is a good step. It's, it's by no means perfect, but it is a good first step uh, in working on these things. Um, and we participated in that process. Uh, when it time, comes time for review of it, we're going to be pushing for much higher levels of contribution, much higher turnover uh, in terms of when things are made to when things are released. Um, we've done some work, as well as other great organizations have done work with the, uh, believe it or not, the Department of Defense and the Department of Justice um, within the United States that have been to make this very US-centric. Um, we would love to be doing more work uh, abroad. Um, we're based in the US. If you would like to help us uh, expand our reach and just like learn more about things that are happening in other places, please talk with me about that. Um, uh, so, they, so like the DOD has actually been doing this really great job of creating more things and sharing them, especially focused on the things that they will believe will help people the most. Um, so yeah, so we're doing work on that side. Um, also, you know, when we do general work about DRM, when we do stuff about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, when we do things that are just related to net neutrality, um, we're also then putting our energy and efforts into like fighting the sorts of institutional things that exist. Okay, so thanks, Molly. Cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>